Our lesson from God's Word for our sermon today, the first Sunday of Advent and Christ the King Sunday, is from the last book of Revelation, from the, of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Here we have a vision in which John, Jesus' disciple, sees Jesus. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the, the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is God's Word. Dear friends of Jesus, it's official. We can finally start thinking about Christmas. As if there weren't enough things dividing people these days. I've noticed the last few years that another division on that list. And it's a division between when people think we should start thinking about Christmas. Have you noticed that too? On the one side, there's the people that, that think once we get past Labor Day, right? It's Christmas time. And then there's the people who say, unless we have celebrated Thanksgiving, not a word or Christmas decoration anywhere, right? And so finally today, we can all breathe a sigh of relief. And we can all agree it's time to think about Christmas. Right? You can get out your lights and your trees and your candles and your manger scenes. and There's just something powerful about the Christmas season. A baby was born to save us. Who doesn't like that? Right? Who doesn't get excited about that? A baby was born to save us. We'll sing the songs, the little Lord Jesus, asleep on the hay. Can finally start talking about Christmas. As we do that, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice how we Christians often talk like Jesus is, is still a baby and not in a good way. We sometimes talk as if Jesus is somebody else's baby. Think about how you treat somebody else's baby. When someone you know is going to have a baby, it's exciting, right? Before the baby is born, you probably have a party, like a shower, and you give some presents. And then when the, when the baby's born, you make a point to go and see the baby at least once. You want to hold her. You want to smile at her. But then you're actually kind of happy to hand the baby back to her parents, right? As you don't have to change her diaper. You don't have to get up in the middle of the night. You don't have to feed her. And we all like babies. But isn't that kind of how we, we treat babies? You get excited when they're coming. You make sure you hold them at least once. And you hand them back to their parents. And you think, maybe I'll see them on their birthday. Maybe. Maybe next year for their birthday. That's how you treat somebody else's baby. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that often how we, we treat Jesus? In the time leading up to Jesus' birth, there's this excitement, right? We have parties. We exchange gifts. When Jesus is actually born, people make a point to go to church, right, on Christmas Eve, maybe. Everybody gets a little excited about a baby being born. This is kind of a neat thing. But then we, we put him away. Because it's not really our baby, right? He's somebody else's baby. Maybe we'll think about him again next year. Maybe we'll celebrate his birth again next year. 
Maybe. That sound like how we Christians in America think about Jesus? It's nice to think about a baby. That's okay to spend some time focusing on him. But we like the ability to just put him away. Right? Maybe next year. We'll celebrate his birthday again. But you're thinking, that's not me. I'm here today, Pastor. I'm even here on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I mean, who goes to church on the Sunday after Thanksgiving? That's good. I'm glad you're here today. It's not even Christmas Eve. I'm glad that your faith in Jesus isn't just for a couple days of the year. It's a blessing. But there's another way that we can treat Jesus like a baby. It's this. What is a baby able to do for you? Babies are cute, but they're pretty powerless and helpless. Babies don't really do things for you. You have to do things for babies. I wonder if that's a way that we still treat Jesus like a baby. Here's some signs that you might be treating Jesus like a baby in your life. I talked with a woman lately who said to me, Pastor, with, with all of the chaos going on in the world, I want you to know that I'm not worried. I'm going to be okay. And I said, that's great. Jesus, he brings us peace, doesn't he? And she said, well, actually, I have a lot of money saved up and I have my house all paid off. And so I know that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. Did you ever find your security in your money? Watch out. You're treating Jesus like he's still a baby. How about this? I think this is why a lot of us get so fixated on politics. I mean, if Jesus is just a little baby, we need to find somebody who's actually got power, right? Someone who can actually make a difference in the world. When God doesn't seem to be getting the job done, we've got to find someone else who can, right? Just watch out. You're treating Jesus like he's still a baby. How about this? How many of us struggle with worry and anxiety? No, I do. Way more than I like to admit. Think to ourselves, I, I love you, Lord Jesus, but it sure doesn't seem like you're in control of my life right now. So I'm worried. I'm anxious. That's you. Watch out. You're treating Jesus like he's still a baby. See what I mean? So you watch Christmas celebrations this year. Just, just take note of this. How often don't we treat Jesus like he's still a, a little baby lying in a manger? Have you ever seen a, a hippo eat a pumpkin? Does that sound kind of out of place right at this point in my story? It's going to fit perfectly. Right? Have you ever seen a hippo eat a pumpkin? I just watched a, a video on YouTube of this lately of a hippo eating a pumpkin. and You know how big a hippo is, right? And this big hippo comes out of the water and opens up his huge mouth and the zookeeper puts in this enormous pumpkin, one of those big orange pumpkins right inside the hippo's mouth. Can you imagine what happened? With just one slow, methodical crunch, the hippo just <laughs> squashed the pumpkin. And its sides split open and all the seeds went flying and it was just squashed. That is what the book of Revelation does to any notion in our minds that Jesus is still a baby. It absolutely squashes it like a hippo squashing a pumpkin. The book of Revelation, Jesus is talking with his disciple John. And Jesus shows John a vision of what he really looks like in heaven. And John described it for us. John says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I turned around to see where the voice was coming from, and behind me I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like a, a son of man, dressed in a robe that went down to his feet, with a golden sash across his chest. Now let's get rid of all the suspense. Do you know who this is that John sees? It's Jesus. He's seeing Jesus. But notice what's different. Jesus isn't dressed in swaddling clothes. He's wearing a robe that goes all the way down to his feet. Jesus isn't lying in a poor, humble manger. Instead, he has a golden sash across his chest, a sign of wealth and riches. In the Christmas song, we, we say, no crying he makes, right? The little Lord Jesus. And we don't know if Jesus actually didn't cry or not, but Jesus in the book of Revelation, 
Not only is he making a sound, but it says he has a sound like a loud trumpet. And can you see how the Bible wants to completely change this picture of Jesus that you have in his head? He's not a little baby lying in a manger. Think of a loud trumpet, robe flowing to his feet, a golden sash across his chest, and so much more. It says his hair is white like wool, as white as wool, and his eyes are like blazing fire. He just doesn't have the little peach fuzz that a baby has on his head. He's got this flowing hair that's white like snow. And, you know, today we don't really always think of white hair as the best thing in the world, right? But in the Bible days, if someone had white hair, it was a sign of wisdom and power and authority. And Jesus, his hair is as white as snow and his eyes are like blazing fire. Maybe you think of how your headlights pick up the eyes of a raccoon or an opossum in the middle of the night and they glow. It's Jesus. It says his, his voice is like rushing waters and his feet are like bronze glowing in a furnace. Can you imagine all this? On the front of your worship folder, there's a, a picture of Jesus. It's some artist's attempt to, to draw Jesus as Revelation shows him. And when you look at it, you'll realize it's, it's missing so many things. How can you put it all in there? How do you draw a voice like rushing waters? I bet when John heard that voice, chills went down his back. Can you imagine that? The voice of God like rushing waters. Eyes like blazing fire. Hair as white as snow, feet like bronze, glowing in a furnace, voice like rushing waters. In Jesus' hand, he, he holds seven stars. And out of his mouth comes a sharp, double-edged sword, and his face shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. And Jesus holds stars in his hands. Do you know how big stars are? To Jesus, they're just like little pieces of popcorn in his hand. That's how big, powerful Jesus is. Out of his mouth comes a sword, and of course it makes us think of the Word of God. The Word of God is the power to kill and to make alive. Wow, this is, this is Jesus. It says his face shines like the sun. Do you spend much time looking at the sun? You shouldn't, right? We can't. It's too bright. It's too powerful. That's what Jesus' face looks like. Just like a pumpkin a pumpkin. Just like a hippo smashes a pumpkin, so the Bible smashes this picture we have of just little Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ the King. When the Apostle Paul, John saw Jesus in all of his glory, he said, look at the cute little baby. No. No, he said, oh, look at that nice little guy. Now, did you hear what John did? He said, I fell on the ground as though dead. When John saw Jesus as he really is, he fell down on the ground like he was dead. This is what sinners do in the presence of our, our holy, perfect God. And remember, this is the, the disciple John saying this. John had seen all sorts of Jesus' miracles. He saw Jesus change water into wine and, and walk on water and feed 5,000 people. He saw Jesus drive demons out of people and rise from the dead. And yet not even John, the disciple, was prepared to see Jesus in all of his glory. Jesus as Christ the King. Think of what this means for you and me. You can't just push Jesus off into a corner of your life and think about him when you want to think about him. It doesn't work. You can't just celebrate Jesus once a year at the time of his birth. That doesn't work. One day, you and I are going to see Jesus face to face, and, and he's not going to look like a little baby. He's going to have eyes like blazing fire. He's going to have a voice like rushing waters, a face that shines like the sun. We hear Jesus described, Christ the King, it's a, it's a call to repentance. The Bible says that one day every knee will bow to Jesus. That will evil happen in our lives on earth by faith or it will happen on judgment day when every single person with fear and trembling is forced to recognize Jesus as Christ the King. When we see how Jesus really looks, it's a call for us to repent. Have you been worshiping Jesus as your King? Do you obey what Jesus says? Do you put Jesus' word and Jesus' will and Jesus' plan above everything else in your life? 
not, today's a call to, to repent. But remember, there was another way to look at Jesus, just like a little baby. One way is to ignore him, to push him off, but the other way is, is to live with doubt and anxiety. If that's you and me today, then this lesson is a call for us to repent too. If you say that you believe that Jesus is your Savior, if you say that you believe that Jesus died and rose for you, if you say that you believe that Jesus has given you eternal life, if you say that you believe that Jesus controls everything that happens in the world, how can you and I be worried? How can we be anxious? When those fears come into our hearts, it's time to repent and look to Christ the King. I wish I could have known what was going through John's mind as he fell to the ground as though dead. I bet there was a part of him that was saying, Jesus, I am so sinful. Forgive me. I bet there was also a part of him that said, Jesus, how could I have ever doubted you? Forgive me. You know what Jesus said to John? He said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Aren't those beautiful words? Do not be afraid. I shared with some of you recently that I saw someone who, who, who had like a, a Facebook post where they said that those words, do not be afraid, show up exactly 365 times in the Bible. Isn't that pretty cool? Exactly 365 times, one for every day of the year. Do not be afraid. And so I looked it up. Of course, it's not true. It's not true at all. all right? You've got to be careful what you see about Jesus on the Internet. But it does happen hundreds of times where God says to his people, do not be afraid. And this is what Christ the King tells to John as he lies on the ground in fear. He says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Jesus is the beginning and the end. He's been around forever. He never changes. This is why you can put your trust in Christ the King. He says, I am the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive again forever and ever. I hold the key to death and Hades. And put yourself in the Apostle John's shoes. Those words from Jesus must have brought back some powerful memories for John. The Bible tells us that out of Jesus' 12 disciples, it sounds like the only disciple who stood at the foot of Jesus' cross on Good Friday was John. He had watched Jesus die. He saw it firsthand. They put the spear in his side and blood and water flowed out. But you remember on Easter morning, two of Jesus' disciples ran to the tomb? Do you remember who it was? Peter and John, and John was a little younger, so he beat Peter to the tomb. John was the first one to see that the tomb was empty. John was also one of those who heard Jesus say, I am the resurrection, the life, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. This is why you don't have to fear. You don't even have to fear death. You don't even have to fear hell or Hades because you can put your trust in Christ the King. He was dead, but now he's alive again forever and ever. You hear this description of Jesus, you, you wonder, why did he ever become a baby in the first place? Why did he ever lie in a manger? If he's that big and powerful and great, why did Jesus ever become a baby? Do you know what the answer is? It's because he loves you so much. Because that's how far Jesus went to save you and me. For all of us here today, how many of us, if we had the chance, would, would willingly go back to being a little baby again? Anybody want to do that? Let's be a helpless little baby again? I think all of us would like to go back to certain points in our past, but I don't think any of us would want to go back to being a little baby. That's what Jesus did. With all of his power and his glory, he gave that up to be born for us so he could grow up for us. So he could die on a cross to forgive all of our sins. So he could rise from the dead to give us eternal life. When you see that little baby in a manger, don't think to yourself, oh, Jesus is so cute. Think to yourself, that's how much God loves me. That's how much God loves me. This is why we worship Jesus at Christmas. It's Christ the King. But I want you to notice one more thing about Christ our King. Where is Christ the King standing? Did you pick that up in our lesson? He's standing in a very specific position. Even if you look at the front of your worship folder, where is he standing? 
He's standing in the middle of the seven golden lampstands. You say, what does that mean? Right? There's a lot of, of, of visions in Revelation that we can't explain perfectly, but Jesus tells us exactly what the seven golden lampstands are. Did you catch it? What are the seven golden lampstands? They're churches. So you think this powerful Christ the King, where is he standing? He's standing right in the middle of his churches. He's standing right in the middle of his people. Just think of what that means for you and me. Christ the King is not sitting on his throne in heaven looking down and saying, huh, I wonder how it's going to turn out down there. No, Christ the King is here with us right now. Christ the King is always standing in the middle of his people. Christ the King has his churches, his pastors, his people in his hand. This is why Jesus says to us, don't be afraid. This is what you and I need to be able to face life. As John begins describing this vision, he describes his life. At verse 9 at the start, he says, I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Christ Jesus. Listen to the words John says about his life. He says, the suffering and the patient endurance. I bet every single one of us could use those two phrases to describe our lives in this world. Our lives include suffering and a need for patient endurance. And if John was going to make it through, what did he need? He needed Christ the King. If you're going to make it through, what do you need? You need Christ the King. When you're suffering, remember Jesus is Christ the King. When you're struggling to patiently endure whatever you're called to face in your life, remember, Jesus is Christ the King. We celebrate Christmas this year as you see that little baby in the manger. Remember this. This is Christ the King. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we're thankful that once again we get to celebrate your coming and your birth. Jesus, we ask that you forgive us for all the times when we make it seem like you're still a little baby. We act that way when we push you off into a corner of our lives, like we can think about you when we want to. We also act that way when we get worried and anxious about so many things. We act as if you have no power or control over our world. Jesus, we're thankful for this vision that you gave to John and through John to us. This vision in which we don't see you helpless and lying in a manger. We see you with power and glory as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, it's amazing to think that you gave all that up to save us. It's also amazing to think that you use all of that power and glory for our good as you walk among us, your people. During this Christmas season, help us to remember who you truly are. You are Christ the King. To you be the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.